theme of Paracelsus has more friends than we suspected. <laughs> Due to the nature of the subject this evening, it will be it will be necessary to consider this discussion and the one next week as two parts of a single theme. Actually, at this point, we enter into phases of the Paracelsian doctrine, which cannot be advanced rapidly. There are so many particular and peculiar meanings to the terms which he uses, that it is absolutely necessary to build a certain amount of background. We have to know how he thought and why he thought before we can hope uh, to integrate his ideas in terms of modern knowledge. We mentioned earlier the Paracelsus traveled extensively, gaining a great deal of his knowledge from so-called primitive sources, from uneducated, simple people who had long practiced the most rudimentary policies and theories of therapy. We should, however, also somewhat amend this because of another important consideration. When uh, Paracelsus died, uh, the survey of his estate indicated that he owned only four books. One of these was the Bible, the second was a commentary on the Bible, the third was a collection of early sermons, and the fourth was a handwritten manuscript on medicine. This was his total collection. When he dictated his various essays to Prolus, or one of his other followers, he used no notes and never made reference to a source. In explaining his own policy and their uh, changing from the established rule of the day, he brought out one of the basic concepts of his teaching, namely that knowledge is derived in two ways, or rather that the pursuit of knowledge is advanced by a twofold method, the elements of which are completely interdependent. In our present terminology, we can say that these two parts of method are intuition and experience. To Paracelsus, these can never be divided from each other. The purpose of intuition is to reveal certain ideas which are then tested and proven by experience. Experience, in turn, reveals certain matters which transferred to the intuitional faculties become the uh, impulses to further growth and development. Paracelsus regarded that either of these separated from the other to be a disaster. Intuition without experience could lead into the most abstruse and abstract spheres without censorship or direction. Experience without intuition would never be fruitful, for fruitfulness comes not from the things done, but from the overtones of understanding which accompany the doing of things. Also, experience is meaningless unless there is within man a power capable of evaluating it. This evaluating factor if absent, caused the individual or permitted the individual to pass through all kinds of experiences 
and either not to interpret them at all or else to misinterpret them. So Paracelsus gives us this power which he calls the equivalent of intuition. And he explains more and more about the meaning of this term as he understands it. How can man have intuition? How is it possible for him to apperceive that which is not obvious or apparent? How may he come to certain inward realization of truth without the assistance of the so-called rational faculties? According to Paracelsus, intuition was the result of the existence in nature of a mysterious substance or essence not in itself essentially a principle, but a life force. He gave this many names. For our purposes, perhaps the simplest of his terms will be appropriate. He compared it to light. Now, according to him, there are two kinds of light. A visible radiance, which we call brightness, and an invisible radiance which we call darkness. Darkness and light have no essential difference. There is a dark light which appears luminous to the soul and dark to the body. There is a visible physical radiance which seems bright to the senses but may be dark to the soul. Thus light is a twofold being, quality, or substance. He uses these terms so interchangeably uh, that we are forced to recognize that he considers light as of the, of the nature of being in its total existence. Light not only contains the power or the energy necessary to support visible things. The invisible part of light supports the invisible powers and functions of man, particularly intuition. Intuition, therefore, is the capacity of the individual to become attuned to the hidden side of light. Now, when he uses the term light, he implies much more than such radiance as may come from the sun or from a lantern or a candle. To him, light is the perfect symbol, emblem, or figure of total well-being. Light to him causes health. Invisible light cause wisdom. And as the light of the body gives strength and energy and inspires growth and development, so the light of the soul gives understanding. The light of the mind gives wisdom. And the light of the spirit bestows truth. Therefore, truth and wisdom and understanding and health are all aspects of one thing. What health is to the body, morality is to the emotions, virtue to the soul, wisdom to the mind, reality to the spirit. This total burden of energy, this total content, is contained in every ray of visible light. For this ray is only a manifestation upon one level or plane of the total mystery of light. Therefore, Paracelsus tells us, that when we look at a thing, 
we see either its objective physical form or we apperceive its light. Everything that lives, lives in light. Everything that exists radiates light. All things derive their light from light. And this light in its root is life itself. Now because there is a spiritual light and an emotional, a mental, a vital, and a physical light, man perceiving things may see them either according to their outward nature or according to their inward nature. Man perceives outward things by his own outward senses, and he perceives inward things by his inward senses. Thus Paracelsus tells us that the heart has eyes as well as the body. The mind has ears. All of the internal parts of man have equivalent senses of cognition. To each one of these natures, a message can be conveyed, and this message comes either from light, which is the source of the energy which conveys, or the message can come from the works of light upon any level or plane. In the case of the physical world, the works of light are epitomized in nature, and man sees nature because of the light which shines upon it. Man sees the life of nature because of the light which shines within it. Therefore, by observation we behold things lighted. By intuition we behold things self-luminous. We behold, therefore, intuitively the true inner light of all creatures, and outwardly we see only the reflection of light upon creatures by which they are visible to our sight. And the thing is true in general of all the sensory perceptions, inasmuch as all perceptions not the eyes alone, depend upon light. In this he might differ from the moderns, but when we understand his meaning of light as containing the total impact of life upon creation, he is dealing with a, an energy or a principle beyond what we generally think of today. Perhaps in a way, this Paracelsian concept of light corresponds with the mana of the natives of the Polynesian group, a mysterious spiritual nourishment, a universal sustaining power. And this again would correspond with the Iroquois Indian term orenda. A render is the light in things, flowing out and causing us to apperceive qualities not immediately available to sensory analysis. Thus we can see the shape of things, their colors, their numbers, and their arrangements by the reflected light of nature. But we perceive the qualities of things their goodness, their beauty, their integrity, and we sense a certain affinity or an antipathy because of our own intuitive reaction to the radiant energy of these other things. Thus we come to know their appearances by visible light, their natures and substances by invisible light. This invisible light, of which the visible part is merely a shadow or reflection, 
arises in the invisible source of light in the solar system, which is the spiritual or original sun. Paracelsus, following the Neoplatonists and some other early mystics, was of the opinion that there were three suns in the solar system. One physical, one astral, or belonging to the psychic sphere, and one spiritual. And these three suns bestow the light of the world according to their own nature. As Paracelsus says, as the light of the physical sun warms and reveals the body, so the light of the psychic sun or the astral sun reveals and nourishes the structure of the soul. And the light of the spiritual or root sun nourishes and sustains the human spirit. These suns, therefore, become the basis of certain qualifications within life, light energy. Now we can carry this point one degree further, and we must. We learn, therefore, from him, from Paracelsus, that the universe in totality is suspended in an infinite extent of spiritual life-life. That all things that have an existence exist within this life, which permeates space, and mingling with the spiritual light of other suns and other cosmic centers, permeates all existence. This sea of eternal life is in substance and essence the luminous nature of God. And we can go back to the Pythagorean definition, which says that deity is an infinite being whose body is composed of the substance of light and whose soul is composed of the substance of truth. Truth, therefore, is a kind of light, for when it shines, another kind of darkness is dissipated. And truth is to the darkness of ignorance what the sun is to the darkness of night. There is also a spiritual sun which has to do with the divine nature of things. And the total energy of this sun is directed to the dissolution of the total illusion, which is mortality or materiality. Thus the spiritual sun is forever dissipating the kind of darkness which we call death and mortality. The psychic sun is forever dissipating the darkness which we call ignorance. And the physical sun is forever dissipating the darkness which we call crystallization. And these, therefore, represent positive forces, working upon negatives, or the depletion or deprivation of themselves. We again gain from the Neoplatonists a useful definition, which he, Paracelsus, made use of, namely that matter is the least degree of light. Darkness is the least degree of light. Truth is the least degree of ignorance, and reality is the least degree of illusion. All things are progressively departing from the source of light, and as they depart, uh, they lose their immediate participation in the fullness of light, and all creatures differ due to their proximities to one of the three great centers of life, spiritual, psychical, material. Having thus a universe of total life, Paracelsus is confronted with one of the oldest dilemmas that there are. 
How does that which is eternally and inevitably is unconditioned enter into a state of condition or separateness? How does it happen that one life in itself a total existence can therefore become differentiated into kinds of life? And why are these kinds of life in various associations benevolent or not benevolent, with each other in the composition of created things. Let us also solve this problem by recourse to Gnosticism, a system or doctrine of emanation. He recognized that things in themselves always alike change their qualities by their relationships, although as individual or separate things they have no differences. Kepler brings this out in his astronomical theory, and it more or less comes to Paracelsus in the same way. For example, we have in the solar system a group of invariable factors, these factors being the planets. Now, Paracelsus had a certain affinity for the idea of astrologia as distinctive from astronomia, but we will in a moment try to explain his position on this also. First, however, we know that the planets composing the solar system and believed by the ancients to exercise certain influence, never depart from the solar system. Therefore, that their influences as they move through their orbit should be continuously the same. And the total nature of the solar system, never in itself changing, or at least not in appreciable time that we can measure, Whatever energies emanate from it and converge upon any part of it should be forever the same, but they are not. The reason why they are not the same is not that their qualities, natures, or bodies change, but because their relations to each other change. Therefore, out of the motions or mutations of these bodies, patterns are formed resulting in degrees of balance and unbalance, and bringing these bodies into different associations with each other. A simple example, of course, is the phenomenon of the seasons on the Earth. The Earth may appear to pass through winter and summer while under the rays of the same sun. It is not that the sun actually departs, it is that the angle of its rays to the earth changes, in this way causing the seasons. Thus, the sun remains the same, the earth remains the same, but the climate changes due to relationship. Now, Perisosa said that in the universe, all mutations of energy are due to relationship and not to the actual alteration of any energy itself. He also denied the existence of antipathetical energy. Therefore, he did not believe in the existence of evil energy. He did not believe, for example, in a death energy. He did not believe in an evil power or a destructive force. He believed, however, that certain mutations or relationships between energy foci were of benevolence to one thing, and other relationships of special benevolence to other things, and that therefore, to something, all energy is benevolent. But because of the mutations on, in the energy field, 
No energy is equally benevolent to all things at all times. Thus we may have depletion of energy. And wherever there is depletion of energy, energy appears to become malefic. Not because it is evil, but because its requirement to the need of a particular organism is not met. At the same time, however, it may be performing a useful service to some other organism, even as while some of us are shivering in northern climates in winter, the southern hemisphere is having an excellent season. Thus, in all things, there are seasons. And in the motion of energy in relationship to a given body, such as the earth, there are both seasonal changes as we measure them by astronomy, there are psychic changes, which we measure by psychic content, and which Plato refers to in his discussion of the great Platonic year as the seasons of fertility and sterility in nature. In this way, Paracelsus maintains the principle of essential good and at the same time permits one universe, one power, one nature to assume various appearances as these appearances may relate to the life and structures of creatures. In this same study, then, we now come upon this great problem of energy. We come upon the mysterious circumstance of man, who is, so to say, constantly immersed in light, even though at night he does not see it, till his earth is bathed in, in some part thereof. This Earth existing within a field of light, which is not denied by the alternation of day and night. He is also existing within a sea of psychic light, and also in a sea of spiritual light. And these energies constantly surround him, interpenetrate him at all times. Man can never be further from or nearer to any essential principle necessary to his survival. The only uh, change or mutation which nature supports is that nature itself is more abundant in certain energies at certain times and is deficient in these energies at certain other times. And Paracelsus, with the skill of observation, pointed out that such seasonal circumstances are noted by animals. Thus, for example, in certain climates, animals hibernate in those seasons when uh, the necessities of existence are not available. Others living in other parts of the world in more temperate climates follow the uh, example of the squirrel, who recognizing intuitively or instinctively that it must prepare for a barren season, stores up its food in advance in order that it may not have deficiency. Paracelsus points out that nature in relation to man is not less provident than the squirrels, beavers, and birds. Therefore, that not only does man instinctively store up certain produce when necessary in order to maintain his sustenance during non-productive seasons, he also possesses within himself reservoirs wherein he can store up psychic and spiritual energy against the great cyclic mutations of nature. Thus man is able to exist 
for some time while energies are at their ebb. He is able to survive numerous mutations of the world because he has a structure somewhat reminiscent of a storage battery in which he can gather and conserve certain resources. And from the description which he gives us, it might be inferred that Paracelsus is referring in part at least to the endocrine chain within the body. But these glands, or rather their magnetic fields, are important as means of storing and regulating the distribution of energy. If, however, man depletes resources more rapidly, and this depletion occurs at time when the restorational energies are less available, he may find himself in a serious state of fatigue, exhaustion, or devitalization. Now, we mentioned that he also uses certain common terms in a different way from those from that with which we are commonly acquainted. He uses the word anatomia, or anatomy. But he tells us that he is not referring to the structure of the human body. By anatomy, Paracelsus says, he means the total constitution of man. And that anatomy, which does not include the study of the soul and the spirit, has no right to say that it deals with the construction of man. That anatomy is also the study of the invisible organs of the body and the invisible system which are behind the visible, the visible or material structure. By physiologia or physiology, he says he means the total function of man, not merely the function of the material parts of the body, but the function of life through the body, the function of mind through the body, the function of consciousness in itself and through the faculties. By astronomia, Paracelsus tells us that he is not dealing primarily with the solar system as we know it, but that true astronomy is the study of the anatomy of the body of God. And that astronomy involves not only the whole physical nature of the solar system, but all of the invisible forces and principles from which the system is suspended, and without the reality and existence of which the solar system itself could not either exist or continue. By astrologia, in the same uh, thinking, Paracelsus says he does not mean merely the interpretation of the effects of planets upon life. Rather, he means the psychology of universal energy. Paracelsus said he did not believe that any planet exercised a good or evil influence, but that in the compound of human beings, the psychic fields of energy could be sympathetic or antipathetical according to mutation, and that the planet merely reflected one power, and therefore only through their mutation could their effects seem good or bad. But nominally they might appear to be so and might actually prove to be so. But this is not because they exist to produce good and evil in the world. They produce only their natural mutation. Now this brings us to the next point, which is a very interesting one. 
Not long ago, someone wrote us a letter and asked me to do research on the mark of Cain. So, this might seem to be a very easy subject, because it was said that God placed a mark upon the forehead of Cain that all men might know him. And later in the commentaries, the old mystical commentaries of the Jews, it was said that Lamech, who was blind, had his arrow guided by his small son. And they were hunting in the forest, and the lad guided his father's bow, and Lamech fired at a creature. And when he approached it, discovered that he had slain his ancestor Cain. And he knew it because there was a mark upon his forehead. Paracelsus gives us a curious, rather quaint, and not entirely undelightful interpretation of this mark of Cain, which incidentally our learned authorities have totally ignored. He says that the mark of Cain is the mark of sin. And that in the life of man, the mark of Cain is disease. For wherever the body is diseased, it is because some law has been broken. Therefore, in some way, the individual is a sinner. Paracelsus hastened to assure all his friends and himself that he did not expect perfection, nor was he going to condemn anyone who was sick. But he said in nature, sickness or disease is in some mysterious way a symbol of disobedience. It is a breaking away from reality. For disease is a falling out of adjustment between man and the universal life principle in which he exists. As long as he remains harmoniously adjusted to this principle, he cannot be truly sick. Now there are many causes which may cause him to depart from uh, the ways of nature. Some of these perhaps come under the general heading of ignorance. He does not know better. He does not know enough to know all things. Another perhaps is superstition by which he clings to false doctrine. Another is fear, in which he lacks the courage to face facts in an emergency. Perhaps still another is the pressure of conditions upon him, in which he voluntarily sacrifices his own well-being and his own integration in the service of something else or someone else or some cause greater than himself. Nature may reward him for his virtue, but it will punish him for his disobedience to the laws of physical nature. He can never do so many things well, or have such noble motives, that he will not have a stomachache if he repeats the wrong thing. He may have reward for his virtue, but he will have a stomachache for his indiscretion regardless of the motive. If, therefore, man possesses this intimate relationship to a universal substance, Cyrus also says man is not unique in this, that actually all nature around man, wherever there is life, whether it is the animalcule in a drop of water, whether it is a mighty tree, or a great animal, or a small herb hiding by the roadside, wherever there is life, there is a focal point of universal life-like energy. So Paracelsus pointed out that it is the duty of the physician to examine the constellations in the sky the terrestrial constellations upon the earth, 
and the physiological constellations within man. He pointed out that the, that the heavens inverted themselves upon the earth, and that for every star in the sky there was a flower in the meadow, and that for every ray that came out of space there was some kind of an integration on every level of structure. There would be a mineral integration, a vegetable integration, an animal integration, and a human integration. Paracelsus pointed out that the animal kingdom had a certain instinctive, intuitive apperception by which it was able to fulfill without knowing. He pointed out that the corporeal body of man is composed of a constellation of animals that within the human being, within the human body, there are species of animals as numerous as any in the world, and that each of these animals within man, in the form of organ, tissue, structure, that each of these animals also has an intuitive, in intuitional, or instinctual participation in the energy and life principle of the world. Therefore, without the help of man's mind, the stomach might do well, but with the assistance of his interference, he will have ulcers. <laughs> Thus, the importance, according to Paracelsus, of recognizing that what we call natural living is permitting the animals in the human body to obey the instincts of God. My thought that every little drop of blood, if you leave it alone, will follow its maker. Keep the law, and in terms of modern uh, legislation, keep the peace. It is only when for some reason this harmony of the world is disrupted. And here, Paracelsus gives us a concept which was later to be developed by the German mystic Bernie, who was strongly indebted to Paracelsus. Bernie pointed out that the difference between man and the animal is that man as a being is a shepherd of animals. In this case, his flock is his body. And within this body, man has will, also self-will. And man, having reached a degree of evolution in which he has escaped from instinct, must escape to intuition or perish. He can no longer allow himself to remain in a state of indecision. And here Paracelsus sounds tremendously Buddhistic when he points out that the human being's determination to fulfill his own purposes without adequate knowledge, without intuitional contact with reality, that this Self-will is what disturbs the entire group of animal beings uh, that would attempt under normal conditions to regulate his bodily existence. Thus his own mind or his self-will causes him to betray the good of the creatures which compose his body. As a reward for this, he destroys them. They cannot and do not intelligently rebel any more than animals or birds can rebel at an unseasonal frost, or cattle can escape a great blizzard. They have, can only patiently wait and die. And in man, 
where the self-will or the mind imposes hopeless situations upon the bodily economy, the animals in man's sheepfold can only wait patiently, suffer, and die. But man, experiencing the suffering and death of these animal centers in himself, regards his life as made uncomfortable, miserable, sensing sickness, disease, and inharmony. He blames the body, blames the world, but never examines himself to find how he has betrayed those creatures that have so patiently and willingly served him. Thus normalcy is achieved by the recognition that we must render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. In this case, that we must learn about the body, learn to understand it, learn to know its nature and its power, and also to realize that it is suspended from psychic and spiritual sources, and that these sources will control, direct and regulate, things that do not break the faith, do not break the relationship, do not permit themselves to depart from the way of life. Thus, Paracelsus gives us his definition of philosophia, or true love of wisdom. He says that the end of philosophy is that man shall learn beyond any doubt or reservation that he must know all that is necessary and obey all that is good in order to survive. And so he does these things, he himself and the world which he fashions is in a state of perpetual hazard. To go back now for a moment to these constellations growing in the meadows. These are plants. They are herbs. And of these matters, this old Swiss Hermes was very well informed. He said, you go out in the field and you search for medicinal herbs. Now, how are you going to find it? Of course, if you have an old herbal, an old book of herbs along, you can identify some of them. But Paracelsus was not an identifier of known herbs. He was a seeker after those things which had not been identified. He pointed out what Hippocrates of Coke had earlier developed, namely the resemblances between things in nature. Paracelsus pointed out what he called sympathetic resemblances. Energies of a similar nature or in octave sympathy with each other or in harmonic ratio of the diatessaron or the diapentes in music. That all these harmonic proportions were visible to the eye if you knew how to recognize them. In a simpler way, the answer was that in its leaf, its root, its berry, its flower, or its fruit, the plant bore some relationship of appearance to the medicinal value which it possessed. Thus we have the old belief, for example, of the mandrake, with its root resembling the human body. We have the heartwort, the little leaves of which resemble the human heart in shape. We have the toothwort, which resembles the human tooth. And by experimenting with these plants and herbs, Paracelsus said that the infinite wisdom in bestowing its benediction and blessing has always given us a key and a clue. And the plants strangely serve those needs of man 
which by appearance, nature, function, or procedure, the plant itself exemplifies. This led him to a further exploration, that man in his comparative ignorance may not notice these resemblances immediately. And it is quite possible that he may use the plant correctly long before he recognizes that it does resemble the very part for which it is prescribed. Therefore, von Hohenheim tells us, the only answer is for the physician to search within himself for the level of intuitive recognition by which he is able to apperceive the energy field of the plant. He may not see it, but he may still sense it. And in the sensing of it, the sensory impulses reaching the brain may take form and cause the individual to have what appears to be a visual experience of identification. Intuitively, man may see more than he can see with his eyes. And Paracelsus advises the physician to go down and sit in the meadow. Relax. With faith and prayer, without which no works are done, and simply open himself to the message of the plants of the field. If he does this, man will find them and he will perceive them almost as stars in his own soul. And he will see the constellation, and he will observe how these little blossoms follow the motions of planets, how some open with the moon and others with the sun, and how each one has a sympathy to all things. Also these plants derive their energy from the two great sources of energy in nature, the outward atmosphere and the earth beneath. The earth beneath, according to Paracelsus, well, not only was composed of the four elements, but was permeated by a peculiar energy derived, of course, from the qualification of total energy. This energy was captured in the earth by minerals and metals. And minerals are to the underworld what plants are to the surface of the earth. Therefore, there is not a constellation in the heavens for which there is a plant in the field for which there is not also an element hidden dark within the earth itself. And Paracelsus discovered some of these secrets while he was working far underground in the mines of the Fugas. Here he learned things not only by observation but from the miners and from the contemplation of these mysteries. He observed also that plants took into themselves what he called the virtues of the earth. He found that great growing in land where there was gold in the soil, would select that gold and draw it into the grapevine so that if the stems of the grapes were burned, actual gold could be reclaimed. But another plant growing only in the same region and maybe only a few inches from the grapevine, if its stalks were burned, showed no gold. Therefore, there had to be some reason why the grape accepted gold and another plant did not. Paracelsus declared that this was because of the sympathy of things. That the grape among the fruits of the vine held a relationship to the gold in the earth. That in turn, the gold and the grape had an affinity to the gold in the human body, and that this gold, in turn, had a particular sympathy for the human heart. 
and that's going on further from the heart. But this same goal extended to the heart of both the planet and the solar system. So the gold and the grape and the heart and the lion and the earth and the sun were all bound together like tuning forks of the same pitch, each belonging in its own kingdom, but each sustained by the equivalent of a specialized energy field. Recent experiments have been made with the, uh, with the use of meteoric ions in the treatment of disease. And these have indicated that the Paracelsian concept of astronomical ions was not entirely without virtue. He also pointed out that it was the nature of all these bodies to draw to themselves out of space such elements as are necessary for their survival. He likewise made the statement that a mineral, while to our perception incapable of essential change that minerals are born, grow, and decrease or age, and finally die. And he gave the example of the growth, growth of gold, which has been known to increase itself seven or eight times without investment, merely in a tightly sealed vessel exposed to certain rays. The growth of this gold causes it to appear like a lichen or morse and to cast off of itself tiny projections resembling blades of grass. Thus gold, when brought into contact with the growth element on its own plane, will expand and increase. Thus, the summary point of this particular approach is to the effect that all things in themselves act as catalysts, and that they are constantly drawing their nutrition from the tremendous potential fullness of what we might even term space itself. Paracelsus agrees very largely with Hindu philosophy, for he declared that the most unsuspected source of all things is space. That while we are busy with the objects floating in space and trying to explore them, we are gaining the lesser end, for it is what we term vacuum, emptiness, the total absence of any known material or physical element that is the total and complete density. What we call matter is a great degree of solidity. What we call space is an absolute degree of density. Are not necessary to matter nor useful to him except under certain conditions. But now we have found that even the poison of the rattlesnake has use if we know what to do with it. Thus all so-called useless things, says Paracelsus, are merely things the uses for which are unknown. There is nothing useful, because nothing can exist except it be sustained by life. Life sustains nothing useless, and the life in no thing can be considered useless or worthless. It has a purpose, and he evolved one of his great medical theories to the effect that there is a remedy in nature for every inharmony of the human flesh and that the great tendency of man 
is to overlook the remedy because it is too obvious and too simple. If he would use his intuiting power rather than his analytical power, he might have solved his problems ages ago. He has forgotten that the mastery of science lies in the intuitive apperception of the principles behind science, not merely the continuous and repetitious uh, experimentation, exper experimentation on a single plane of approach. If then there is an energy for everything, and there is only one energy, basically, this energy is like the mysterious blood of the Messiah. The mysterious blood that was forever moving in the San Grail. The blood of life. The blood of the sun. The life upon which all things exist. Paracelsus therefore said, all energy, in any and all of its forms, is a century sacred. It is sacred because no human being can actually control it. The only way the individual can participate in it is by controlling himself, not the energy. Also, that there is no energy of any kind that is not a direct manifestation of the power of God. Thus all things live upon deity and within deity, and all energy have therefore a divine reason for existence, and they are all manifestations of this one total energy, which is the root of all. Nutrition is actually the possibility of moving energy from one organism to another of compatible nature. This means that in some way a magnetic focus has to be established. Energy derived from food is not derived from the substance but from the compound energy focus behind the food. Take, for example, a simple thing like a grain of wheat. To us, this is simply a seed. We call it the staff of life. But this grain of wheat, if understood in the Paracelsian manner, is also a universe. It is composed of an infinite number of small parts coming very close to the electronic theory or the atomic theory. Each of these parts is different. And the arrangement which they form together and the sympathetic focus which is set up in them causes them to be weak and locks within them the power of this wheat to come from an appearance of death to an appearance of life, so that a handful of wheat found clasped in the mummified hand of an Egyptian pharaoh and buried in his tomb for 4,000 years when planted in the ground grew. It could not grow, however, until the suitable situation was provided. This suitability, Paracelsus greatly emphasized. All remedies operate only within fields of suitability. A remedy given at the wrong time or to the wrong person, though categorically correct, may fail. There must be suitability. And suitability means that there must be a capacity to receive the energy itself. 
First, when the wheat is made into bread and the bread is eaten, it is not the body of the wheat that nourishes. We now talk about the wheat germ and the oil from the wheat germ and how much more powerful these are than the shaft and the flesh of the wheat. If we go still further, Paracelsus said, these are all refined. But the nutritional unit in the grain of wheat is totally invisible. It is totally incapable of being analyzed or examined. The only way we can ever know it is when we capture it in a medium. And perhaps up to the present moment, from a nutritional standpoint, one of the most powerful mediums we have captured wheat energy in is the oil of wheat germ. This will be consistent because in alchemy, oil is always the most important of all media. Oil is the alchemical substance it comes nearest to capturing life. Thus the spiritual mystery of life in the sacraments of ancient times. These sacraments consisted of anointing the head with oil. And this was used to preserve the descent of the prophets, the descent of the kings, and the apostolic succession in the Christian church. The anointing of oil with the carrying of the Spirit. Thus oil becomes a subtle medium. And many things are contained most subtly and sensitively in their oils. Or in their elixirs, as Paracelsus called them. Or in their essence, as the Atta of Roses in which the greatest power of the energy of the road is held. This is therefore adulterated many times in the making of perfumery. So the problem of nutrition was, according to Paracelsus, several fold. He was not, however, convinced that the separation of the energy unit from its formal structure was entirely suitable to man. He said, when you are feeding this mysterious sublimated substance, which has already passed through a great refinement or alchemical digestion, that certain energies are lost in this process. Therefore, if these energies are too subtle, there is no hay left for the horses. In your body, you have all these animals and plants. The plant requires good soil and fertilizer, which is supplied by one part of the grain. The animal requires another standard of nutrition, which is supplied by something else. And the inner life of man requires the essence, or the substance, in order to survive. It is therefore better to recognize that the body of the seed feeds the body. The soul of the seed feeds the soul. And the spirit of the seed feeds the, feeds the energy spirit field of man. Thus essential. All of these different levels of energy are normally released by digestion and distributed proper, uh, properly according to requirements. If we modify or change the elements before they are accepted into the body, some part of ourselves or our domesticated menagerie goes without he would probably use this as one way of explaining the effect of adulterating food. That in, in process of adulteration, 
or in the process of various over-refinements of food products, there is danger to the system because of the destruction of the balance of the nutritional energy field of the food itself. Man, as a living being, lives upon life, not upon death. He lives not upon the flesh of animals, but upon an essence or an energy. He lives not upon the poor, tired carcass of a carrot. He lives upon energy. And it is only to the degree that he is able to rescue energy that he is able to attain nutrition. These various food products also live by energy, which they derive from the earth and the air. Thus energy is like a great stream flowing forever in a circle, moving from one level to another and finally returning to the earth and the air to be redistributed like the stream of a mighty river flowing from the mountain to the sea, to be gathered up by the rains and cast back upon the mountain. All of these cycles he regarded as the secret of man's health program. Recognizing now that man at this stage of his growth and of his development, living in a world of energy which he does not understand, and still suffering largely from devitality, must seek for the ways to rescue his health and to restore his energy field. Energy derived from food sets up poles in the body which in turn draw more energy like magnets. If, for example, therefore, you take a certain food which contains an unique particle of gold. You take this food into your system, and the energy field behind gold is strengthened as a polarity in your body. The moment this polarity is strengthened, all gold in atmospheric space all energy which re uh, reacts to the vibratory power of the gold polarity finds in you a receiving station and flows in upon you. Therefore, the maintenance of the chemical elements within the body, although many of these elements exist only in very minute quantities, the maintenance and balance of these poles, this maintenance ensures man's rapport with the total energy field around him. The depletion of a mineral polarity in the body will result in man refusing or rejecting or failing to take to himself the energy from space around him relating to this pole. If, therefore, the pole of iron is weakened in himself, he will not accept iron from light, from the sun ray, from the air he breathes, or from pure cosmic space. The cosmic space motions of Paracelsus are probably the cosmic rays of today. But these rays, although they are constantly permeating, penetrating man, are not received or held by him unless their polarities are established in his own body. Some of these rays are of such nature that if their polarities are over-intensified and become too strong, can also destroy man. Under such conditions, nature protects him by giving him only the minimum amount that is necessary for his function. The study of this problem is now partly covered, but not, any, but not totally, by the broad theory of biochemistry. But there is much yet that has to be done before this subject can be said to have been handled in a thoroughly Paracelsian manner.
First, Paracelsus said, how are we going to get these rays and these catalyzing agents polarized in man who is suffering from some ailment and therefore is in trouble? This led to a further consideration. Why should man suffer from this imbalance? Why does not nature protect him against it? The answer, according to the Paracelsian corpus, involves two things. First, man does not inherit disease. He does not inherit cancer. What he inherits from his parents is psychochemical deficiency. If the parental body is deficient in certain chemical elements, it cannot supply these to the fetus. Thus, the individual inherits a lack. And because this lack, through its own depletion, is an absence of adequate energy, of a certain type and kind, it opens the individual to such ailments as are natural to such depletion. If, therefore, there be in any family a tendency to ailments, noted for several generations, perhaps, where all members of the family at a certain age began to fear diabetes, cancer, tuberculosis, or any of these ailments, the child does not inherit them unless they are malignant at the time of birth and the child is exposed to a direct infection or contagion. Actually, what the child therefore must know or what must be known for the child is that immediately every possible effort from birth should be used to strengthen the depleted pole, increasing as far as possible the availability of the missing energy element. If this can be strengthened, and it cannot actually be totally absent, because, as Paracelsus points out, the total absence of any one indispensable element makes birth impossible. The only thing that can happen is a children. There can be no essential factor totally missing. But there can be an unbalance in which some factors are not as abundant as they should be. Therefore, we will say that if the ailment involves a deficiency in copper, this does not mean that copper polarity is absent, but is not enough. Therefore, Paracelsus says, just as light and moisture must cause a seed to grow, so light and moisture must be brought to bear upon the seed of copper in the body of the person in which it is deficient, thus causing it to grow. And the soil necessary for its growth must be enriched so that it may draw adequate nutrition in its own substance and that its energy field may thereby be restored and if it cannot be restored, then the supply must continuously be artificially provided to prevent the individual from ever manifesting the symptoms of the illness. This thinking for the 15th century, 15th century is not bad thinking. And it tells us things that we should perhaps remember more than we do today. Now, Paracelsus has also been accused of being a magician. 
because many of the cures and achievements which he wrought were considered little less than miraculous. But it all breaks down to a pattern. He recognized a certain group of essential elements. He sought in every part of nature for such organisms as were abundant in these elements. And by means of these organisms, he sought to prepare the various remedies which he used. He carried his alchemistical researches even further than physical chemistry, because he said it is useless merely to depend upon the health of the body for the maintenance of the soul. Just as surely as the depletion of the physical elements represent imbalance in the body. So these de this depletion in some way bears witness to the depletion of the psychic and spiritual polarities behind. These must also be built, restored, and corrected. For a chemical deficiency producing a certain ailment in the body will produce a certain emotional tension. It will also cause the individual to think in a certain way. And as Samuel Johnson pointed out, a drop of green bile in the liver has been responsible for more wars than perhaps any other single cause. Wherever there is a physical disturbance, it bears witness symbolically to a psychic disturbance or a spiritual uh, disturbance of some kind in these energy fields. As a magician, Paracelsus attempted to take pure substances, substances carefully prepared, and apply them where the deficiencies existed. He did not depend totally upon, for instance, physical gold. He knew that gold had an affinity to the heart. He knew that the magnetic field of gold carried a powerful heart stimulant and regulator. But this was not enough. Even if the physical heart of man could be brought back to reasonable normal, there were other things to be considered, namely the psychic field behind it. Or, in most instances, these depletions run through an entire chain of vehicles or through an entire group of processes. So Paracelsus says the next thing we must do is strengthen the gold. We must make the gold more versatile. Because actually, gold has a meaning to birds and plants. It has a meaning to the magnetic field of the earth, pure gold brought in contact with various things, may have various reactions. It may cause one thing to happen in a plant, and it may be quite different in its effect upon a dandelion and a rose bush. Therefore, it is not enough that we deal with gold. If that was the answer, all we would have to do it associate ourselves with the seven sacred metals and we would all be well. But like the mysterious ring of Gyges, this is not enough. The next problem, therefore, was to recognize that kind of gold which was essential to man, dividing this gold from the gold of nature. The next problem after that was to compound gold in itself. And to do this, it was necessary to capture within gold a group of magnetic formulas. Paracelsus did this by, use, by invoking the aid of planets. He used various planetary configurations at the time of melting and casting gold. 
declaring that under various seasons, at various altitudes, and in various localities, gold, while in a mutable state, took upon itself specialized attributes that were not always present. Having prepared these formulas, Paracelsus then went a step further into what is commonly called today transcendental magic. He pointed out the Egyptian belief that every symmetrical solid, that is, the geometrical forms which form symmetrical bodies, that each one of them had a therapeutic power. This therapy being the capturing of energy in line that form and the design of form captured and held energy. Therefore, that a picture of an energy carried a certain reaction of that energy with it. Some years ago, I made a number of experiments with the Paracelsian concept of primary form using sensitive electrical equipment to determine uh, the radioactive result of energy form. We observed that a person looking at a cube measured a certain degree of energy. And when this same person looked at a sphere, the energy rate changed. This is the Pythagorean formula, that if the correct form can be produced or presented in nature, that the individual can be healed through the eyes, that order, mathematical sequence, proportion, design, color, arrangement and sound, all can be equally therapeutic. The great art is to distinguish clearly which of these tones exaggerates and which minimizes the activity of energy fields on various levels. Paracelsus then took his soul, which he had carefully muted, he then inscribed upon it a certain form, perhaps one of the symmetrical solid. He then also captured upon it a group of sounds through words, much as the mantrams of the East or the sacred syllables upon the petals of the Buddhist lotus. He held that not only were these figures, letters, designs, and sacred tracing important because of their sound equivalent, but because the individual seeing letters thought words in his own mind. When he saw a certain word spelled out, he did not have to speak it. In his own mind, that word took living quality and was interpreted as an idea. Combining all of these elements together, Paracelsus fashioned talismans, sacred to all of the planetary and celestial bodies, ornamented with certain designs, and inscribed with certain sacred thoughts, prayers, magical invocations, or the names of planetary or zodiacal angels following the ancient magical concept that has come again from the Gnosis and from the Syrian mysteries. And having gained all that he could, and in this knowledge he was greatly aided by the Arabs who had carried it much further than the Europeans. He then placed this carefully prepared talisman or medallion upon the body of the sufferer in the area where the disturbance was 
or where the pole of that disturbance could reasonably be assumed to be, either over a nerve terminal or close as possible to some vital organ. He bound it there or held it there in various ways, declaring that this medallion, this talisman, this thing which was not different from a sacred relic of religion, essentially, having been duly and properly prepared according to an exact knowledge of universal procedure, this became a catalyzing agent, becoming powerfully radiant and capable of bestowing supporting energy to the part of the body involved. He left several manuscript works dictated to his disciples relating to this phase of his energy study. But we cannot follow him too far at this point because it is only a fraction of the tremendous amount of reflection that he bestowed. His second concept was equally interesting, namely that almost all of the talismanic devices, including the geometrical forms, the harmonic chords, and the musical modes which were used in ancient times in religion and therapy. But nearly all of these had a certain and powerful success because of their reaction upon the human mind. Therefore, he came to the conclusion early that one of your most powerful gathering powers and distributing media is the mind itself. But the physician, knowing how to direct his own mental energy, can, through conformity with the laws of structure, stimulate or vitalize magnetic fields. We must, however, understand thoroughly how to condition this energy, how to bring it into that kind of energy necessary to assist the patient with a particular ailment. Paracelsus did not believe in simply the good thought method. He believed in the scientific directing of a conscious formula just exactly as specifically considered as a pharmaceutical formula. But just as the doctor gave a written prescription to be filled, that the physician with his mind devised the prescription and then directed it by mental energy to the patient. If the patient could and would respond finding temporary assistance over a crisis or a critical situation. In this same development of energy, Paracelsus pointed out that there were two very important factors that had to do with energy. One of these factors was space. He acknowledged primarily and immediately that much healing was faith healing. But he said, do not for one moment suppose that faith healing is not scientific. It is not scientific usually for the, those participating in it. But if it was not a scientific fact in nature, it wouldn't work. In other words, it is a science that man has not discovered as a science. The miracle being the scientific fact unknown. Faith healing operates according to a distinct pattern of laws. The most important of these laws is that by means of faith, the individual becomes receptive faith, belief, these are equalizing 
and tranquilizing power. Therefore, a little faith is as good as a sleeping tablet. A little faith is better than a tranquilizing drug. The purpose of the drug is simply to break tension. And the most simple and natural way that man in his intuitive idealism has discovered to achieve this end is through the simple fact of faith. Under faith he ceases to fight. Under faith, he becomes patient. Under faith, he has a natural believing. And under faith also, he places himself psychologically in the care of something other than himself, which is his most important contribution. The moment he stops taking care of himself, he gets well. The reason being that he does not know how to take care of himself and hasn't the willpower to unfold a program and keep it. If, however, through faith he ceases disobeying, if through faith he no longer blocks the psychic field through tension and pressure, he becomes open and available to remedy of all kinds. Paracelsus said, when you take a medicine, the first duty of the medication, or the first need of the medication, is that it shall overcome the disposition of the patient. The man takes the pills and don't believe a word of it, but I'll take it anyway. You have to get over the disposition of the patient. Or you have to get past the indiscretions which his disposition are causing and thereby interfering with his health. So between the medication and the ailment is always the disposition of the patient. If through faith this disposition can be brought into a certain natural sanctity, a gentle and devout attitude, the medication, whatever it may be, can be more effective. And also, the resistance of the body to the active, active principles of the magnetic field will be reduced. As most ailments begin primarily in tension, anything that will help to remove tension is therapeutic. Paracelsus also tells us the importance of prayer. He tells us, scientifically speaking, that prayer produces very much the same result as faith, except that faith is a receptive believing, whereas prayer is a more positive or objective statement of conviction. Prayer is associated with a positive, internal, intuitional visualization of principles. The individual in praying, either audibly or to himself, fashions actual words, states them, and solves them with a conviction, and in that way, performs a simple, intimate, personal, religious action. It is obvious that the human mind is so constituted that it cannot hold several ideas simultaneously with the same intensity. The prayerful attitude, the prayer formula, the visualization in word and symbol of a strong belief these set up vibrations which adjust to and associate with the magnetic field. Therefore, a positive statement of prayer has a vibratory positive rate, which rate is therapeutic. 
because it carries with it devotion, a subconscious sense of sublimity, a restoration, at least temporarily, of a certain spiritual relationship between man and space. These factors set up motion. They set up reaction in the magnetic field. So by our thought, by our words, by our deeds, as Zarathustra tells us, we achieve virtue. And virtue now for the body is a state of health. If then, through indiscretion, energy fields have been depleted, we can do one of several things. We can either do as the animal does by instinct. We may simply relax back into adjustment. And if we can succeed in doing this, we will probably find almost immediate assistance. It was intended primarily and eternally, as Paracelsus clearly states, that each human being is to be his own physician. The existence of the physician is a proof that man has not yet come into his own full birthright. Man becomes a physician for himself by keeping the law and by holding such attitudes as preserve the integrity of the magnetic field. The moment cross vibrations come in, we have a depletion of energy. Negative vibrations move in one direction and positive in the opposite. These clashing neutralize or destroy each other's effectiveness temporarily, and the structure is damaged. Actually, no vibration of a negative nature can injure a positive vibration, because your positive vibration is true and can never be anything else. But the negative vibration set up in the compound constitution of man cuts him off from the positive vibration, thus leaves him incapable of responding to it, and therefore in a sickened or depleted state. This problem of sympathy, Paracelsus then carries through the various fields of therapy with which he is primarily concerned. He points out that the complete circulation of the body due to proper clothing, proper exercise, proper light, proper work, proper rest, proper sanitation and cleanliness, these things are regulated, helping the individual to prolong the usefulness of his material energies as far and to as great an extent as is reasonably possible. Therefore, to neglect or ignore these is the simplest and most common way of injuring oneself. The next is through false nutrition, the introduction into the body of material, the psychic poles of which draw energy of the wrong kind. Anything, therefore, that man sets up artificially as a polarity, and which represents something not suitable to his true nature, or, if suitable in very small quantities, is not suitable in larger quantities, if such false polarities are established, then the individual may rapidly come under pressures from the energy field, which may be habit-forming or may result in the destruction of his natural human integration. The next point of great danger, of course, is that whenever tension, pressure, or stress have a tendency to reduce function, 
They attack, first of all, the great abdominal area of the body. The individual usually, and except in comparatively rare cases, always dies first in the abdominal area. This means uh, that it is through the dis disruption of the processes of assimilation and excretion that the backload of toxin is built up in the body. The abdominal aorta and the great abdominal plexi and ganglia are the ones that react almost immediately to tension and lock the entire process of assimilation and excretion. Where this happens and the condition is not corrected, the body is poisoned. And this means that gradually the energy fields are broken away from the body. The links between energy and matter are so polluted that the energy is no longer responsive to these polarities. The vibratory rates are lowered and the body gathering lower energy levels from its own lower rate of vibration reduces and reduces its own function until finally it is no longer able to maintain itself. Thus the problem of breaking tension and preventing obstruction. Wherever obstruction reaches to advanced a state, there is a corresponding local beginning of the process of death. This process of death is a localized disintegration. If this is permitted to go on, like the death of a finger and gangrene setting in, the whole body may ultimately be destroyed. Therefore, obstruction, anything which prevents the adequate flow of energy, must be watched with the greatest of care. This energy flow through the body is not by means of the physical nervous system, but by means of a vital etheric counterpart, which is called the vital vehicle. This vital counterpart carries within it the very tiny streams of energy. And where your arm goes to sleep, or something of that nature, through pressure, or through uh, being placed in an unnatural position, this simply means that the etheric magnetic field has separated from the physical structure. And therefore, that the physical structure is temporarily without energy nutrition of a certain kind. All, of course, is not covered because all energy does not move in the etheric field. But it is cut off temporarily. And the return of this energy field, which must break through the skin now to return to its present or normal situation, causes the prickling that accompanies the awakening of a sleeping arm or leg. Paracelsus observed that in the case of the amputation of a limb, that the etheric part of the limb remaining with the person retained indefinitely a sympathy to the dismembered part. And he brings in a number of instances in which pain has been reported in an amputated arm or leg. Examination proves that when the arm or leg which had been cut off was buried somewhere it had been put in a wooden box with the lid nailed on and one of the nails had gone into the member. When the nail was removed from the amputated member the pain in the living person's invisible arm stopped. Among interesting examples of that unless we regard it as totally superstitious is that exactly the same report is given to us by Lord Horatio Nelson, who said that he continued to feel pain in his own amputated arm for years. 
And on many occasions, when in the dark, had the complete feeling that he had the member. Thus, Paracelsus said, these magnetic fields have sympathy to each other. The difference between the etheric vehicle and the physical body is also of another kind, namely, that it does not mend itself from any scar or anything of that nature. The physical body will mend, but the etheric counterpart will retain the scar forever. And all scars on the body are due to the scars in the etheric field. If, however, the scar is removed by plastic surgery, it is not removed from the etheric equivalent. And those possessing any extrasensory perception can continue to see the scar after it is no longer visible. Paracelsus also pointed out that sharp instruments can injure the etheric part, even though they do not touch the physical body at all. And this gave rise to the idea of Digby's weapon saw that an instrument which has pierced the etheric field of a human being like a sword and wounded him. But this sword will carry from that time on something of magnetic sympathy with the person it struck. The steel will take on the magnetic pole. Thus metals and substances become exchange polarities for vital and energy sympathies. And from this great concept of these related sympathies and how they could be adjusted to serve man and how the human being could develop an entirely new concept, concept of therapy by the association of his own body with other substances would be the continuance of our discussion of this sympathetic theory, which now enters into the field of the mumia, or the mysterious substances derived from the dead, which are used to maintain the life of the living. And for these phases, and the next step of this subject, as I told you, we'll have to wait until next week.